All right. So let's just continue um, quickly. If you finish early, then we'll finish early. Okay. So now what we're going to look at is um, general comparison between uh, HPLC system and the GC system. Okay. So um, some of the aspects that we're going to look at is first one, sample volatility, sample polarity, sample thermal liability, um, sample molecular weight. And we also look at sample in terms of sample preparation, um, volume, sample volume or sample size, and separation mechanism generally. And uh, we're going to look at uh, some of the detector that are commonly used. Okay. So in terms of sample volatility, uh, volatility, if you're looking at HPLC, long slide. If you're looking at HPLC, so um, HPLC doesn't require any sample that can be volatile. Okay. The the requirement is just the sample must be soluble in a mobile phase. Okay, so that's the general aspect. So the mobile phase either be either it be an aqueous mobile phase or an organic mobile phase. It doesn't matter because towards the end of the day, you can set your system to um, the system that of your interest. Okay. In comparison for GC, the sample must be volatile. If if it can cannot fly then get a fly so to say okay so it's worthless um on gcms or, or gc so to say okay so in terms of sample polarity um both system hplc or gc can separate polar and non-polar samples or compounds um but an advantage of hplc is it can separate ph um which is uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon Okay, an example of P, uh, pH is this one. So this is one of the simplest uh, pH, uh, naphthalene. So one of the molecules that we've looked at, especially for Malaysian, um, we, we, one of the active ingredient in ubat gagat. You know, if, if you do know this, is naphthalene. So uh, it, the, the molecule kind of like um, uh, is not being liked by um, cockroaches. So this is one of the active ingredients. And if you look at um, naphthalene, it has a high boiling point. Therefore, it is not suitable for GC. Probably naphthalene is still acceptable for GC, but as you go into a more, a higher degree or a larger uh, pH molecule, then you can definitely see that it will not fly and thus it is not a suitable uh, for GC use. Okay. However, it, you can still use it for HPLC as long as it dissolves in the solvent system. And especially if you look at the structure, it's more an organic compound. So perhaps um, you definitely you cannot use um, water or, or aqua um, solvent system. Um, you, but in a different way, you can actually use say hexane and ethyl acetate system to actually analyze a pH. Okay. In terms of um, thermal liability of a sample, HPLC, of course, as I also mentioned, um, can pretty much scan anything, okay? even if the sample is thermal, um, thermal decomposition or thermally uh, unstable. Okay? Uh, because for one thing, HPLC, it can still work if you reduce the temperature. So you in the sample collector, for example, you can set it to be close to one or two, or two degrees Celsius, of course, depending on your module. So some module can go down um, about close to zero, one to two degrees, as long as your solvent or, or your sample is not frozen, it's good enough. Um, and also some HPLC system can work in say uh, two or uh, 20 degrees Celsius or, or room temperature. Okay. However, for GC, of course, because you need to heat your sample, then um, a sample that is thermal liable, um, it's out of the picture. Okay. Sample molecular weight, on the other hand, uh, if you're looking at GC, normally you, you can analyze sample with um, less than 500 AMU or, or delta. <coughs> because to the other day, the bigger your sample um, molecular weight is, normally it will increase in boiling point, which is uh, it goes back to um, um, simple term. It goes back to 
um, volatility of your sample. So high boiling point, meaning that it's not as volatile as a lower boiling point sample. On the other hand, for HPLC, theoretically, there is no upper limit. Okay, so the upper limit is only based on equipment um, slash target compatibility. So meaning that if, um, say, for example, if you want to analyze a huge protein, okay, um, say the protein is about 50 kilo Dalton, very, very huge. So um, the only limitation that for you to use HPLC is by looking at whether the column is compatible, okay, uh, whether it's a UHPLC or HPLC system, whether your column is actually compatible, and whether your detector is actually compatible to you know detect proteins. So um, that's why I, I put it there. There is no theoretically no upper limit in terms of the molecular weight. Okay? As long as it's compatible. So if you have a mass spectrometry that is attached to um, a HPLC system, but the mass spec only detects uh, molecular weight up to say 1000. Okay? So of course, if you have a molecule of 50,000 kilo Dalton, even though the sample can run uh, properly in, the, in, in your system, um, it can separate properly, it can separate properly in your column. But if your detector system is not compatible to the sample that you're looking at, then pretty much you will not get your results. Okay. So, um, however, in, in practice, another limitation is just solubility. What do I mean by that is um, some soluble, uh, some sample are soluble uh, at say 10 grams per mil, or probably not 10 grams per mil, um, say 10 grams per liter. But if some other sample might have a solubility of um, 0 0.1 gram per liter. So that can be part of the limitation. Okay? Um, but otherwise, you know, it's, there's, there's no um, big issue in terms of the molecular weight itself. <coughs> so in terms of sample preparation, um, GC and HPLC, normally you still filter it, uh, even though there is no requirement for GC to uh, for you to actually filter a GC sample, uh, but of course, if you do see particles, it's by by no means are good for either system, especially for HPLC because HPLC um, has a very very tiny pores. There's a lot of tiny pores everywhere in your column, um, in your mixer and whatnot. So um, if your sample is from say a river, of course. That there might be a lot of microorganisms in there. There could be uh, a lot of uh, other solids. So you, you might want to filter it so that you can clear out all the other large molecules or micromolecules and just focusing on the molecules of interest. Okay, So samples should be in the same solvent as mobile phase. So um, what do I mean again by, by this sentence is sample must be dissolved. So it must be compatible to the solvent system that you are um, actually uh, analyzing. So again, one case that I've mentioned previously is for naphthalene, so, so the PAH, uh, PAH uh, molecules. So they are very hydrophobic. Um, of course, if you use uh, an aqueous based uh, system, it will just simply precipitate out into the system and it will clot everywhere. Okay, so, but if you change into a more um, organic system using hexane, for example, and pH dissolve properly in that particular system, then you will not have any issues in running your sample. Okay, so in terms of sample size or volume, HPLC, the limit is just based on the column uh, internal diameter. So, and this is of course related to the void volume, which we will look at when we touch on uh, column uh, type of columns and whatnot. Okay, but for today, I'm just going to give you guys the terminology, the void volume. So this void volume determines the quantity of the sample that you want to use, uh, that you can use in a HPLC system. So say, for example, um, as, as I mentioned previously, I have used one um, HPLC system having like a very huge um, column whereby you can inject or you can purify up to one gram of sample per run. Okay, so that is more on industrial purification level or, or not, not high industrial, but like a semi-industrial 
uh, preparation level. But you can also have a smaller ones, which are very tiny and very short, that is that serves only for analysis or analytical. So for a sample, for a column that's small, then of course the sample size must be very small. But the, the advantage of having a small column and a small sample size is the uh, sensitivity of the whole system. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, I, say for example, if you are looking at, or if you are uh, planning to analyze, um, say if you, look, if you are working in a hospital, right? So you are planning to analyze um, a drug that a person A consumes. Okay, so you want to see whether that person have consumed drugs or not. You might take a urine sample. You might take um, a blood sample, for example. Of course, there's there's a few um, uh, equipments that you can use specifically to test drugs. But this is so to say, if your hospital only have uh, HPLC, how do you actually do it? So you have you need to have a system that is very sensitive. Um, to a small quantity of molecule. So if you have that system using this very small column, then of course you, you can just take a very small blood sample, um, do a little bit of uh, preparation, and then run on your HPLC. Um, having known the standard of drugs that you are looking at, you can do a comparison whether that person has um, consumed a drug or not. Okay, so that's that's one example. Um, but if you have a very big column, a huge column that requires um, a big sample size, um, and um, you just take a small sample, you put it in, it will not be as good as well. Okay, so a column for HPLC normally correlates to what expects uh, you um, want to do. If you want to do a purification, then normally you have a very huge uh, internal diameter. If you just want to do an analysis, a quantification, a quality, then you normally have a very small diameter of um, of column. Okay. <coughs> GC, on the other hand, normally um, you normally in general perspective, you just use GC either for uh, a, a quality analysis or quantity analysis. So you don't really need um, a high quantity amount. Because again, GC is a destructive um, equipment, so it destroys the sample that you are using. However, HPLC can either be a destructive or non-destructive, depending on um, the analysis, uh, the, the, the detector that you are using uh, as tandem to the HPLC. Okay, so typically you just need one uh, very small, one to two microliters of sample. In terms of separation mechanism, um, GC and HPLC doesn't differ that much. Um, what I've written there, HPLC is both stationary phase and mobile phase take part in terms of um, sample separation. So you have your uh, column as a stationary phase and mobile phase, what it means there is that, um, say for example, if, um, I cannot think of a good example now, but say if, for example, you have a, a again, a river, uh, your sample comes from a river. Okay. And you are interested in looking at or analyzing um, volatile organic compound that dissolve in the river. Okay. So instead of using a, an aqueous system uh, for your purification, you might want to opt for a um, uh, more organic type solvent okay. so that you can dissolve organic and organic compound, uh, organic system to uh, analyze organic compound. So it will be easier. Okay, so um, in, in that sense, the mobile phase takes part in terms of um, separation because um, even when you mix in, mix, mix your, your sample and your solvent system in the first place, it will only dissolve what is um, your, your, what's molecule, the molecule that, that you are thinking of analyzing. Okay, so and then once you have the sample in your solvent system, you can run your HPLC and again, it will interact with your stationary phase. Thus, uh, the separation mechanism for HPLC involves both um, the mobile phase and the stationary phase. Okay, so this is if you're looking on a different perspective. GC, um, on the other hand, depends highly on the mobile phase. So the, the carrier, even though you do have a stationary phase, but um, the mobile phase takes priority because 
you know, you, you normally for GC you inject, you don't inject simply a, a blank air, um, even though you, you can depending on your system. But in general perspective, you dissolve your sample in a liquid and then inject this very tiny liquid um, into your system. Okay, so the mobile phase takes priority or um, has a huge um, influence in your analysis. Um, in comparison to HPLC, both actually takes part in the sample analysis. Okay, and finally for detector, the most common ones that is being attached to HPLC is UV vis detector. You can have PDA and uh, different types of uh, UV vis detector. <coughs> It is a wide range non disruptive detector. That's why it is widely used. Uh, for GC, on the other hand, is the most common one is FID. I'm pretty sure you guys have learned about FID with Dr. Mugunda. Okay, so it's universal for all organic compounds, so it's easier for, for organic compound analysis. Okay. Alright, so this is where um this is one of the three last slides. Um, and this is just to showcase on how your tutorial uh, will be okay so normally um, if it's a face-to-face -face class what i would do is i will normally divide you guys into smaller groups um say now you have 22 so pro normally i will divide in in five or four per group so you will have five groups four groups okay and then from these four groups um i will give you guys the same question like this so if you have a sample that you want to analyze okay so how can you actually do it so say for example if i, if I give you guys six diff different carbohydrates okay that's an example and then i give you guys this is the chromatogram okay and these are all the parameters for your analysis of course these are all theoretical um, and, and normally the groups that has more people uh, experience in hplc will normally give a better results uh, a better answer but it doesn't mean that those who, who do not um, have any expertise in hplc doesn't give a, a good answer um it, it varies a little bit okay but generally this is the type of question that i'm going to give and the big question that needs to be solved is which peak correspond to which sample and so how do you actually solve this so you have five different or six in this case six different sugar and these are the parameters. How do you identify <coughs> this sugar correspond to which peak? Okay. Uh, and, and this is part of the um, type of exam questions that I normally ask because this type of question looks at your understanding on the principle of um, HPLC uh, separation, uh, separation or in HPLC system. Okay, so you, you know that your sample type is sugar or carbohydrate because if you look at all six, they are all carbohydrates. So how do you actually um, try and solve it? Okay, so for one, uh, for, for one thing that you need to focus on, of course, this is one, you know, if this type of question comes out in your final exam, you have pretty much covered every single thing. So you have covered all these parameters and how these parameters influence your separation. Okay, so column, for example, you are using Zorbax um, ammonia. So what it means by Zorbax ammonia is on the surface of the particle has a lot of, um, um, sorry, ammonia, amine, <coughs> has a lot of amine functional groups. Okay, and if you know the chemistry of sugars, then you know sugar, like for example, glucose shown in this image now, has a lot of hydroxyl. Okay. So if you have a, 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 a column that has a lot of um, amine functional groups and you have uh, a glu glucose with, which has a lot of hydroxyl, then you know that you can easily form hydrogen bonding. Okay, Hydrogen bonding between your column and your uh, molecule. So you know that it will stick um, and the interaction will be rather strong. So how do you actually solve it? Um, and the answer would be, uh, this is just one, one example, okay? So this is another example, um, type of variety that I can ask. So if you, if you just look at the, the carbohydrate, if you're just focusing on the carbohydrate, one way for you to answer this is by looking at what are the differences between these sugars, 
Okay, so how many hydroxyl has fructose has, how many hydroxyl has glucose has, what are the structures, how big is the structure, and what or, or how can the structure influence um, the separation. Okay, so if you look at the um, structure of the molecule itself, then you, you can have this chemical formula and you can have these structures. Okay, from here, you can um, understand Okay, fructose has this type of structure. It's a very small molecule, um, but it has uh, more functional groups that can form uh, hydrogen bonding with your uh, column. Okay, so if you're thinking about that way, then you know uh, a sample that has um, uh, less number of um, OH groups <coughs> will have a reduced interaction between your sample and the column. Thus, a reduced interaction means that it will come out faster. Okay, so that's um, generally the basic principle behind um, the tutorial. Okay, so what you need to do is pretty much you need to understand what the question is and um, how do you propose um, an answer. Okay, so that's, that's about it. Um, normally, you know, we'll, after we had our break, um, this session takes a lot of time um, because I'll put you guys in groups and then from the groups, you will do your own discussion and finally you will present. So it will be more interesting if you actually do that, but um, I don't think we have a breakout session in, um, in Google Meet. So, um, and I, I don't want to use any other platform to, to actually do the lecture because Google Meet is very easy and it's very lightweight. Um, so, I think that's it for today. Okay. Um, this is just one example <coughs> of the tutorial. So, uh, you can expect you know, next week we will have, because that's, that will be our first tutorial, that will be the um, kind of like um, expectation for the type of questions that that, that I can ask, okay? Of course, you might have not learned every single thing, but uh, the tutorial lasts for about one hour. I have a question over there. I, I will have a question for you guys to think about. And of course, normally, uh, oh, of course, I plan to um, relate the questions in tutorial to the lecture, okay? Either to that particular lecture or the lecture that has been covered. Okay, in this case, um, for tutorial number one, I will include lecture number one and two, okay? And then tutorial number two, I will include um, content from lecture number one, number two, and number three, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's, that's how the tutorial will be. And I'm hoping that by having this kind of tutorial, you will learn something and it will definitely, and it will, it will help you in your final exam in terms of understanding the principle behind it. Um, and um, yeah, principle and, and all the other chemistry related things that you, you're gonna learn, okay? Um, I think that is all for today. We're going to finish early. Um, anyone ha has any questions that you want to ask? Feel free to ask me now. Just raise your hand or you can just unmute and, and ask the question. Anyone? Doctor, for the tutorial deadline is how long or on, the, on that day we have to submit? Okay, so you need to submit on that day. Um, the answer... So uh, I planned it so that the answer won't be more than one pitch. So the maximum that you can write is just one pitch. Okay? Yeah, yeah so it, it won't be like an essay where you need to write five pages and whatnot. It will be just a simple, um, uh, simple uh, practice, tutorial practice, but this will give you marks as well. Okay? Yeah, so it, it won't be as heavy um, as a, a quiz, for example, because the, the marks is only like 5% per tutorial. So it is just for me to uh, gauge your understanding based on the materials that has been covered. All right. Um, I will have more instruction on the next uh, week. I'm actually uh, trying to uh, kind of like put in, so that's why I haven't posted the lecture notes for next week. I'm actually putting kind of like the, an instruction on how to actually um, do your tutorial and where to submit and whatnot. Okay, any other question? <coughs> uh, 
Okay, if there's no more question, um, thank you everybody for being here. Do not forget to key in your attendance, uh, go to Spectrum and uh, make sure you key it in. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, stay safe and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.